Good afternoon. Welcome to Cooking with the Commissioner. I'm Commissioner Martha Schrader from Clackamas County, and I'm here today to once again share a bit of my Italian heritage with you with a special dish called Caponata Siciliana. And as many of you know, uh, I do have an Italian heritage, and my family is from Sicily, and there is a story behind this particular dish. A number of years ago, I had the opportunity to visit Sicily, and I was in this very small town up in the mountains called Erice. So I was walking the streets of this little Italian town, and it had Arab influence, Spanish influence, Italian influence. It was really a very otherworldly place. And I happened upon this small little restaurant, and I was so hungry, I thought, well, this will do. We'll go up there and I had one of the most delicious dishes I've ever had in my life, and that's what I'm making for you today. This is a very traditional Sicilian dish. You can do it multiple different ways, but we're gonna do it in a very classic style today. And what does it have in it? It has two eggplant peeled and cut into one half inch cubes, salt to taste, one quarter of a cup olive oil, one cup finely chopped celery, one onion, finely chopped, two cloves garlic, minced, one and a half cups fresh plum tomatoes, 12 to 15 green olives, pitted and coarsely chopped, one and a half tablespoons drained capers, two tablespoons red wine vinegar, two teaspoons white sugar, two teaspoons minced fresh basil to taste, one teaspoon salt and black pepper to taste. It is, it was the most stunning, delicious meal that you can ever have. It is really, truly a beautiful dish because you can use it many different ways. Pretty much you can just use it as a relish and just have it on some nice crusty bread. You can cook it with fish. Last night, I actually made mussels and I mixed a little bit of this caponata into the mussels and it made the most beautiful broth. So not only can you eat it on, his own, on your own, which is what I did when I was back in Sicily, you can also use this wonderful dish as a base for cooking other things. So let's get started. Um, I've already got some ingredients chopped up, but I'm gonna go through it with you today so you see exactly how we do it. I'm gonna first start with finishing to chop up white onions. And I really just kind of keep chopping them like this. Mm, I can smell the onion. There's nothing like a fresh onion chopped as long as it doesn't make you cry. <laughs> and I'm lucky right now it is not making me teary-eyed. So here we go with our onion, and I have a bowl here, and I am going to go ahead and take the rest of my chopped onion, get it ready to place in the bowl, and this will be the, one of the first ingredients we put into our caponata. And of course, there's no Italian recipe that doesn't always need a little touch of garlic with it. So I actually I'm going to chop up for you right now two tiny cloves of garlic right here. And I'm just gonna mix that in with the onions because that's a really nice, easy way to do it. So here we go, getting our garlic all chopped up. Uh, chunky pieces work. You can get it as small or as chunky as you like. I, I kind of like my garlic chunky, actually, because I think it, it adds a little bit of flavor. Occasionally when you eat something like this, you'll get a nice, flavorful bite of garlic. So hopefully, all of you who are going to try this dish will also be garlic lovers. So here we go. So there we have right now garlic and onion. And the next thing that I think is a little bit unusual for Italian dishes, but I'm going to chop some up and put in it, is celery. So here we go, washed, ready to go. And I'm just going to go ahead and give that a nice big few chops to have that ready. Okay. There we go, that looks like plenty, so we'll just save the rest of that and let's chop it up a little more. So, so far we have onions, we have garlic, and we have our celery. 
And I'm just putting them in little bowls here so it'll be easy for me to add it when we move to our saute pan. Because this is not a baked dish. This is a dish where we use what I call my famous glug of olive oil, where I pour a little in the pan, and we'll be sauteing all these delicious vegetables together. So here we go. There's some more of our chopped celery. Now, the real piece of the dish that we have to always have in an Italian dish is tomatoes. And uh, you can use canned tomatoes in this dish, but quite frankly, I've always felt that getting it fresh from the farmer's market, because that's one of the things I want to tell folks, all of these vegetables I'm using today, I was able to pick up at the Milwaukee Farmer's Market in downtown Milwaukee yesterday. So it's all fresh, it's all beautiful, and these are the last of the Roma tomatoes of the season. So I was very, very happy to find them there. And they're plum tomatoes, they're a plum tomato. They are a meatier tomato, so they're not as juicy. You want to have a little bit of depth to your tomato here so it doesn't get too, you want it juicy, but you don't want it to get too juicy here. So here we are with my plum tomatoes that I am chopping, chopping, chopping. Oh boy, they look delicious. I was so happy to find these at the farmer's market yesterday because tomatoes are just about over. And I lucked out, went to this great little farm stand uh, where I was really glad to support. And she had beautiful plum tomatoes. And I think I bought almost all of them because I, I know that I'm going to be using them throughout the winter. Because many of you know, in my previous show, I talked about how to roast tomatoes. So I have roasted tomatoes that I freeze and I use for other recipes. But today, I'm making them fresh for this particular relish. So here we go. More chopped tomatoes. Oh, they look so beautiful, don't they? Ah, oh, they're just luscious. Oh, it's just the, the fall bounty, just the last of it that we can really enjoy now. So what else am I going to add to this? I'm going to add uh, olives. And this is kind of an interesting thing, too, because normally um, with olives, you don't usually, I don't usually uh, use them in cooking. But this dish calls for green olives. And I actually found some olives that actually are stuffed with jalapenos. And I decided I would use them with stuffed jalapenos because it would add a little bit of kick to the relish. So here we go. Last little bit of olives with jalapenos, and I'm just kind of chopping up here to add to my ingredients. Oh boy. This is an interesting dish because it's savory and sweet. And people have asked me, Martha, why are you always cooking an eggplant? <laughs> I do a lot of eggplant because I think it's a delicious vegetable that is probably the most unappreciated vegetable that we have. So I guess I can tell you that one of my goals in life is to let you know that no, eggplant is beautiful, it's delicious, it not only looks pretty, uh, it can be fixed in ways, in multiple ways that are extremely flavorful. So let's recap real quick, okay? I have chopped my onions. I have chopped my celery. I have chopped my green olives, and I have a bowl full of freshly chopped Roma tomatoes. Now, there are some other ingredients that I'm going to tell you about right now, because this one's kind of a specialty ingredient. This is what we call pine nuts, and this is often used in Italian dishes. It's used in cookies. It's used in sweet savory dishes, and this particular recipe also calls for pine nuts. And I actually found these in Safeway. So they are read readily available. And I decided to make sure that this was authentic. And then if I could find pine nuts and include them in the recipe, we would go there. Also, capers. Again, easily found in your local grocery market. Capers kind of add a nice, salty, savory taste to this particular dish. And of course, the usual salt, pepper, and lastly, at the very end, as I fix this, you will have a little bit of sugar and red wine vinegar. So let's get started with our saute. What I need to do now is to go over to the stove and use my famous 
glug of olive oil. And we're going to start sauteing all these beautiful vegetables together. And we're going to get them nice and cooked, nice and, um, you know, kind of brightly done. You should still see the beautiful colors of the green and the white and the red with the tomato. And then we'll follow by adding these other ingredients. So let's go to the stove. And here I am. I'm going to coat the bottom of the pan with olive oil. And I usually just kind of, as I said, you know, you, there are measurements for this, but I'm an Italian cook, so I usually just put a glug in, as I always say. So that's looking pretty good. As you can see, it's coated the bottom. And I'm just going to roll it around a little bit, the pan here, so we can make sure that happens. And you can see, I love the size of this pan. This is my pan from home, and it's a huge saute pan, and I use it for almost everything I cook. So let's turn on the heat. And I'm going to put that at about medium. We're going to let that oil heat up a little bit. Yeah, just coat it. And I probably will not be using any more oil in this particular piece. We'll use a little more oil when we do the eggplant. All right, I'm first going to start with onions. All right, let's get this. Mm, look at those. A little bit of onions. There we go. And I'm going to start with the celery. We're going to put the tomatoes in a little in a few minutes. We're going to get this all nice and sauteed at this point. Kind of just get it all nicely coated with olive oil. Here we go. So let's see. Ooh. See how nicely colorful that looks? So we have our beautiful, beautiful celery. We have two cloves of garlic chopped up in there with the onions. And we're just going to let this saute. And I'm just going to turn it up a little bit. There we go. A little bit to let, get that all nice and coated and all nice and pulled together. Oh, it smells delicious. And as far as the olive oil goes, I just go to find any kind of extra virgin olive oil. This particular one is from one of our local markets. It's a good all-around olive oil. It really works nicely with these vegetables. But you don't have to fuss too much about what olive oil you get. I always suggest extra virgin, though. I think it gives it a better flavor, better taste. So here we go. Let's let that heat up. Mmm, smells delicious already. Oh, I can smell that onion. I can smell that celery, that touch of garlic. Wow. There we go. And while I'm sauteing it, I'm just going to take a little bit of salt. I usually use garlic salt. And I'm just going to take a few pinches. And you know, the recipe will tell you how much salt to use, but you can always salt to, to taste, which is oftentimes what I do. So there's a little salt. I have a little black pepper. Just going to get that started in here to really get that. Oh, I can hear it sizzle now, too. Oh, it's perfect. Look at that. Doesn't that look absolutely fabulous? Oh, wow. Wow, look at that. So, just going to saute this for another few minutes. And next, I'm going to add one of the more important ingredients. which is my Roma tomatoes from the farmer's market. And some people peel their tomatoes. I don't. I don't mind the peel in there. To me, it, it adds some extra texture, a little more depth to the dish. And some people seed their tomatoes, and I don't really do that either. I really like having the whole full tomato in there. So you can do it either way. But for the ease of this recipe, I always just take them and put them in. Oh, and look at how beautiful that looks. Oh, just get a look at this. Isn't that glorious? Look at that beautiful white and green background and these delicious tomatoes. Just, oh, wow. Now this dish, 
is influenced by um, Arab cuisine as well as Spanish cuisine. That's the other interesting thing about Sicily. It, Sicily was kind of a melting pot crossroads of the Arab Spanish world and um, the Italian, the Mediterranean world. And because of that, a lot of times Sicilian food is just a little bit different than some of the mainland foods. It's quite different than the food that you have up in uh, northern Italy, for instance. But, um, but, the, but the flavors and the influences really have, as I said, it's like the little town of Arice. You could just feel the weight of civilization there. And to be able to go into that little restaurant and have this delicious meal, and it was kind of serendipitous. It was accidental, really. I was just hungry and walking around. But um, I'm so pleased that I can recreate that dish for all of you here. Oh, and look at how the tomatoes are cooking down. Mm -hmm. We want them a little chunky. I won't cook them down too much. I kind of like it as a, as a sweet and sour relish as we put the other ingredients in. Okay, so here we go. And you're probably thinking right now, where's the eggplant? Well, we're going to do the eggplant next because we have to fry it up in a little bit of a pan, but we're going to get all these ingredients, the main ingredients, ready in this pan first. So here we go. All right. So that's looking beautiful. Right now, I'm going to put the other two ingredients. As, as I mentioned, remember that the little bit of sugar and vinegar goes in at the very last. But right now, I'm going to take capers, and I'm going to take my pine nuts and I'm going to integrate them into this beautiful, beautiful bowl of food. So here we go. Capers. And pine nuts. Oh, wow, look at that. Now you can see that it's really starting to cook down. It's really starting to incorporate all the flavors here. Oh, look at that. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, the tomatoes are getting a little cooked into the rest of it. And look at how brightly colored it is. It's just, it's not only a delicious, easy dish to make, it's also, it's just colorful. It really makes you think, uh, even though it's fall, in a way it kind of makes you think of summer. And here's one of the last ingredients. Okay, a little bit more salt, a little bit more pepper. I'm gonna put a few pinches in. And now I'm going to add my chopped green olives, and we're going to put those in there, and there we go. And we're going to toss this around a little bit. Ooh, that looks fantastic. <laughs> so let's recap the ingredients, onions, tomatoes, celery, capers, olives, and a little salt and pepper to kind of have it get nice and tasty and good. So this is the base of our caponata. And right now, I am going to shut this pan off. We're just going to let it cool a little bit. Because now we have to do the pièce de résistance, and that is how are we going to add our uh, eggplant to this delicious dish? And then how are we going to serve it to folks? Here we go. Well, now we're going to move on to the second part of the dish. As you saw, I've already pulled together the tomatoes, uh, the celery, the onions, a little salt and pepper, uh, a little bit of the, the pine nuts and the capers. But the real pièce de résistance, the best thing about this dish, is the eggplant. And as I say, some people go, what do you cook? with eggplant. <laughs> well, I'm happy to say it's one of my favorite vegetables, and uh, I want to convince people that it can be one of your favorite vegetables as well, because they're beautiful. I mean, they're black, they're shiny. You can go to your farmer's market and find many different varieties, and all of these varieties would wor work in this dish. But this is just a, a black globe, uh, beautiful, beautiful eggplant, and it's going to be easy to chop.
You can peel it, but frankly, this recipe works just as well without it peeled. And my uh, job is to try and keep this as easy as possible for folks. So I'm just trimming off the top a little bit. I'm going to cut the eggplant down the middle. Whoa, isn't that beautiful? Isn't the, those colors just absolutely stunning? Look at that. Now, you can use one really large eggplant, but I'm using two smaller eggplants this time just to do it. But if you had one that was twice the size and bigger, that would work too. But this is what was at the market, and I snagged them because I wanted to make sure I got la the last of the fall eggplants because they are in season now. So I just trim off a little bit of the top and the bottom. Then I just cut it in half. Here we go. And then I'm just going to, you can see how beautiful it is inside, how meaty it is. Oh, it smells beautiful. It smells so fresh. And now I'm just going to take it and I'm going to chop it up into nice chunks. Ooh, let me turn this one around so I don't hurt my finger here. There we go. Okay, and I'm just going to chunk it up. There we go. Just go ahead and keep cutting them, get it all, all nice and kind of reasonably good chunks. And we are going to saute these, again, with a little salt and pepper, just freshly with olive oil in another pan. So we have not yet added the eggplant to the main dish. That's going to come after we cook this and after we chop it up. So here we go. Oh, isn't that lovely? So, not only have I made this eggplant dish, but go ahead and take a look at cooking with the commissioner. And the other dish that you'll find out how to make is eggplant parmesan, which is also quite delicious. I have to tell you, I think Italians have multiple ways to make eggplant. <laughs> and here we go, chopping it up. And it doesn't matter if they're not all the same size, as long as they're nice chunks and kind of get them into cubes as best as you can. But I don't really fuss too much about, about um, how accurate it is, whatever. I just make sure it's nice and chopped up. There we go. And here we go here. Got one half left to go. And I think two is going to do us just fine. If you want more eggplant in it, you can certainly add another eggplant. I have two more eggplants here, but I think that just these two are going to be plenty for the dish that we're trying to make today. All right, here we go. All right, almost done, almost done. So we're finished chopping, and I'm just gonna do this the easy way. <laughs> First, I'm gonna put some olive oil into another pan. So this is a two pan dish, folks. There's no real way around that, so I use a smaller saute pan for my eggplant because I'm just cooking it alone right now. So I am just gonna pick this up like so we go. I'm going to actually bring, I haven't turned on the heat yet, so I'm just going to bring the pan here. I think that's an easier way to do it. And I'm going to put all this lovely eggplant into the second saute pan. It's a little smaller, but that won't matter. That won't matter. And here we go in the bottom. And I'm also going to sprinkle this with a little salt and pepper. Let's see what we have here. There we go. Tiny bit of pepper. I'm going to coat it with a little more olive oil. Here we go. Just to make sure it's kind of coated a little bit. Because we're going to gently saute and fry this in the, uh, in the pan. So here I'm going to bring it over. Here we go. And once again, I'm going to turn on the heat. We'll get our, 
and I usually start this at medium to get started, and then if I need a little more heat, I'll bring it up to high. But here we go. Now notice I'm coating it with the olive oil because I really want to get these nice and soft and nicely, uh, nicely browned. And this may take a few minutes, but just be patient. It's worth the wait. So here we go. All that nicely, nicely coated. And maybe, because I like glugs of olive oil, I'll put in another glug. <laughs> okay, here we go. There we go. Oh, doesn't that look delicious? Okay, wow. I think that I like cooking so much um, and making these kinds of dishes is I was lucky enough um, to grow up in an Italian family. And, um, you know, most of my aunts and my uncles um, and my mom and dad, they're gone now. But every time I cook these kinds of dishes, it brings me back home. It brings me back to remember the warmth and vitality of the house where I lived, where we had lovely food and lovely holidays, and um, really, I think, uh, helped make me a, 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 better, a better commissioner somehow, because I really believe that I learned all about public service from my Italian family and how they treated one another and how they treated other people. And of course, the bonus is we also had ex wonderful, delicious food all the time, and I was privileged, and I've said this before, I think, and other times to many people, that my grandmother, Principia Rose, um, helped take care of me when I was a little girl, when I was a child, and a lot of how I learned how to cook uh, was really not using recipes, believe it or not. It was mostly just by watching and tasting and learning. So you do have a recipe for this particular dish that you can follow. Um, but if you want to start adding and experimenting, don't be afraid to do so. Anything you do to this dish would probably make it better. Some people not only put pine nuts in this dish, they also put raisins in this dish. Some people just eat it plain on bread, okay, and, and they use it as just kind of an antipasta dish. Other people use it with seafood and fish. As I said earlier last night, I did a practice run on how to make this, and I actually steamed some clams and steamed some mussels, and then I took some of the caponata that I'm making now, and I actually, I actually put it in the broth with a little bit of white wine and a little bit of butter with the clams and mussels, steamed them open, put this beautiful relish in it, and it was one of the most delicious Italian uh, shellfish dishes I've ever I've ever had, so you don't have to um, you don't have to stick to one thing. You can experiment because another thing I'm going to experiment with. I found uh, at again at our farmers market with our fish market. I found this beautiful beautiful piece of fresh cod, and one of the things I'm going to do uh, is saute it with a little butter and oil get it lovely, uh, flaky, crisp, maybe add a little lemon to it, and then I'm going to um, use the relish on the fish, and I think it will be absolutely a delicious thing. So this dish, caponada, is not only just a meal in itself. It can be used to enhance any other thing that you'd like to cook, from, as I said, an appetizer to seafood, um, I'd even try it maybe with some pork roast. You might want to try a little bit of as a side vegetable. I think it would be delicious. So it's a pretty versatile, it's a pretty versatile all-round dish. And as I said, the best part of this is you use eggplant and who'd have thought? All right, I'm just going to let this brown a little bit more. All right, well, I want you to take a close look at the eggplant. It's been cooking for about four or five minutes. You can see that it's cooked down and it's getting a little brown and crusty. It's just how you want it. I hope people can see that because I usually cook by sight and it's getting nice and soft. It's getting um, really, really lovely, lovely cooked down and brown and very simple to use. So this is the last thing that we're going to do. I'm going to take this off the heat right now. All right. There we go. 
And remember, these are all the vegetables we cooked a little earlier. I let it cool down a little bit, as you can see. Mmm. Oh, I can smell the eggplant. You can see the steam coming up, and it smells delicious. So, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to put this heat on a little bit because we're going to heat up our vegetables. There we go. I'm going to put it to about medium again. And this is where we take our eggplant and we just add it. Here we go. Hopefully we can see that. You're just going to add it to the rest of the vegetables. So it's pretty easy to do. A pretty easy recipe takes two skillets. I'm going to lightly heat it up again. But now, there you have it. Nice big pieces of eggplant chunks, all nicely kind of sauteed and, and fried. And now we're going to heat it up a little bit more. And the last two final ingredients are happening now. And you can do this to taste if you like, but I'm usually careful with too much sugar in this because I kind of like things to be a little bit savory as opposed, but if you wanted it a little sweeter, you could put in a little more sugar. So I have, let's see, a teaspoon here, it looks like, and I'm just going to take a teaspoon of sugar and sprinkle it in. There we go. Just a teaspoon, maybe a little bit more just to kind of add a little bit of that. And next I'm going to take red wine vinegar. I'm going to pour that in. Here we go. Ooh. Ooh, let's see how that looks. Mm. And now we're just going to cook it down. Doesn't that look beautiful? An easy caponata can be a full meal on its own. You could put a little Parmesan on it. And we're just going to let this saute now to be a beautiful, beautiful relish. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Doesn't that look delicious? And of course, I wouldn't be an Italian if I didn't at least try and have a little taste of it. Let's just go ahead and see. Mmm. It's perfect. Mmm. Mm -mm -mm. And we're just going to let it cook down for another three to five minutes. Heat it up. Let these flavors all meld together. I don't think it needs any more salt, but if you taste it and you think it needs more salt, we can do that as well. But right now, I think we are have a dish that is absolutely perfection. This is an authentic Sicilian dish, and um, it was one of the best times I ever had in Sicily, finding this delicious dish and knowing that I had to learn how to cook it so I could share it with everyone else, uh, and particularly find these beautiful vegetables at our own farmer's markets so we can recreate delicious Italian food here in Clackamas County. All right, so we're going to try the last little bit. We have our Sicilian caponata uh, made, and uh, it looks lovely, but I have to add a little bit of uh, garnish to it. And so I'm going to talk to you about how I do this. These are basil leaves, and I roll them up like little pillows, and I just slice them like this so I have nice little ribbons of basil. And it's pretty easy to do. I know I've shown people how to do this before on the show, and I'm showing you again. Just get your leaves, line them up like so. Okay, here we go. Rolling it up to make my pretty green basil ribbons. Here we go, there's one ribbon, there's another ribbon, there's another ribbon. Oh, and this basil is directly from my garden in, uh, in Lake Oswego. I always grow basil and tomatoes in my garden. If nothing else, you can really, if you have tomatoes and basil, your life is good. <laughs> what can I say? And eggplant, of course. There we go. So let me roll this up. It doesn't have to be a neat little pillow. It just has to kind of be a rolled up pillow. 
So let's slice this, make our ribbons. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, and that's looking pretty nice. Here's another uh, slice. The other thing you can do if you want to do a, a switch up from basil, you can always chop up some parsley as well with this dish. But I think everybody knows I kind of have a I kind of have an affinity for basil. I'm just going to take this and give it another few little chops just to kind of break down those ribbons a little bit. Let's just get it so it's going to be a lovely garnish on top. Here we go. Oh, it smells great. Oh. oh, there's nothing like fresh basil. It's it's the most wonderful thing in the world. I just love it. But now we're going to do what I call our pièce de résistance. I'm just going to uh, go to the oven, go to my stove top, actually. And I am going to take our caponata. And I'm just going to very gently, ooh, look at that, roll it into my beautiful Italian pottery bowl. <laughs> There's a little bit left in here. I'm going to try and get it out. Here we go. There we go. Let's not leave, let's not leave too much delici deliciousness anyplace else. So here you go. Isn't that glorious? Now I'm going to take a little basil and I'm going to sprinkle it on top. There we go. Oh, that looks beautiful, doesn't it? Let's try that again. Here we go. Ah. Oh. Okay. So here we are. It looks beautiful. You can sprinkle parsley on top if you'd rather not use basil. But this is a gorgeous dish as a light dinner on its own or a lunch. And you can use it, as I said, cooking with fish, cooking with seafood. You can use it as a side with pork roasts and other kinds of food as well. What we're going to do today, though, because I have a guest coming, my dear friend uh, from the North Willamette Valley Experiment Station, Mike Bondi, is going to be here. And he's going to tell us a little bit about what the Experiment Station does. He's going to tell us where all this beautiful food comes from and how they help our farming community. Uh, he was the one that suggested eggplant again, and I thought I can step up my eggplant game. And what I have with me here with this dish is some beautiful crusty bread from Grano Bakery right here in Oregon City. And um, I thought we'd keep it simple today and have some of this delicious um, eggplant, this, this beautiful dish, just plain with some crusty bread. And uh, we can soak up the juices and just have a, a really nice time with our bread and uh, having all this beautiful dish just kind of soak up and uh, be a wonderful, wonderful thing to have. So stay tuned. Mike will be here soon. And we'll be sharing this beautiful meal together. Well, good afternoon. Uh, this is Clackamas County Commissioner Martha Schrader with my dear friend uh, Mike Bondi. And Mike is the executive director of the North Willamette Valley Experiment Station. Actually, he's the director. He's the man. And he's one of the reasons that I made eggplant today. And uh, Mike, you want to show us the eggplant you brought from and tell us a little you bit bet. about that? <laughs> this is Black Beauty. It's probably the most common commercial variety that we see in the grocery stores and in the markets. Um, it's a classic kind of an Italian vegetable. Oh, okay. And I think uh, going to be a wonderful part of today's meal. I think so too. And I want to thank you for that because this is exactly what I used. Um, I used this, this variety because it is the most common eggplant. And uh, people sometimes call me the eggplant queen because they're mm -hmm. like, who eats eggplant? And I said, well, it's, it's a delicious vegetable, trust me on this. And really wonderful with tomatoes. <laughs> tomatoes and, and all the oh, yeah. fresh items oh, yeah. of 
the garden today. Well, well, that's where I got most of this at the local um, farmer's market, mm -hmm. and I wanted you to come um, to actually taste it and tell me what you think. And we're doing it really simply today where um, I'm just doing it with crusty bread. But, mm -hmm. but you're having a, um, well, let's have a tasting first. I have a couple of questions to ask you. So help yourself, my okay. friend. Have to, and have right. a piece of bread, and let's Looks see what beautiful. you think. Looks really yeah. beautiful. So what yeah. do we have in the dish besides eggplant? Oh, we've got eggplant, we've got tomatoes, we've got basil, we've got Italian mm -hmm. pine nuts. Um, yeah. I did that, a little bit of sugar, a little bit of, um, of uh, celery, a little bit of salt and pepper, got capers. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, it's kind of a, a be all and end all. And it, when I was cooking, I was telling people one of the reasons I wanted to make this is I ate it in Sicily once, mm -hmm. a little town way up in the hills called Erice, mm -hmm. and I was so hungry, and I just found this one little spot, went in, and I had this, and I decided that was the, that was the best thing I've had in a long time. So help yourself to some okay. bread and tell me what you tell me what you it. tell me what you think of this here. Oh, I'm gonna do a little bit. That was a wonderful time of the year yeah. for all these veggies. Mm. And, oh, it's still warm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So eggplant, celery. Mm. Oh, wow. And I could see this being served over pasta or... Mm. I know. I wanted to ask you about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Because you're having, um, at the research station, you're having a, a, a big, big party on Friday night. Can you right. tell us a little about that? And that you're actually going to be serving... Something like Believe this. it or not, <laughs> coincidentally, we're going to be ser serving a very similar dish. Uh, ours is going to focus, it's also a caponata, um, but going to focus w on artichoke mm -hmm. as well as eggplant mm -hmm. and then uh, peppers because peppers oh, are so wow. plentiful right now. Um, and, and it's going to be served over pasta. So kind of, a, I think it's called a Pasta rustica, or something like that. <laughs> That's so this what I is like a about. great, uh, a great uh, opportunity mm -hmm. to kind of get the taste buds ready. Oh. Our, our event this Friday night is what we call the Harvest Dinner at yeah. North Willamette Research and Extension Center down at Aurora, and um, we have done this event for the last ten mm -hmm. years, and mm -hmm. it's a kind of a celebration of the end of the growing season. But also we use it as an opportunity to showcase our research and the crops that we've been working on over the mm -hmm. summer in our research and our education programs and then kind of tell a little of that story uh, through the meal. Um, and um, it's always a lot of fun. Now, we've, we've had as many as 300 people, but this year with COVID mm -hmm. and restrictions, we're limiting it to a much smaller group. Well, I'm gonna be there for sure. And I'm right. delighted that I could make a version um, because what you've described is another way you can add other vegetables to this. It's a pretty versatile, really pretty versatile dish. It really just requires eggplant. But I think the, um, I think the artichokes, uh, I put a little basil in this, but you can put mm -hmm. parsley in it. Um, it's usually the last of the fall vegetables that we're getting in here. It's just been, it's just a really versatile dish and you're right. You can just eat it plain like a relish with bread. You can use it over pasta. And what I did last night, I, I don't know if I told you this already, but um, I had some, I found some really beautiful mussels at the mm -hmm. farmer's market. Mm -hmm. So I steamed them with a little wine and butter and then I added this to it and it was one of the best. If you like fresh seafood and clams mm -hmm. and mussels, it's another way, a really versatile thing to so, so what do you think? Is it oh, it's fabulous. Look up to your standards? Okay. <laughs> really good, yeah. I, I should confide that I have Italian in my heritage as oh, well okay. from Sicily. Mm -hmm. Although I don't really remember a dish like this growing up in, as kids. You know, we ate a lot yep. of pasta, obviously, and seafood and pasta and mussels with pasta, but I don't quite remember this dish. I, I didn't grow up with this specifically either. So that's why I was delighted to find it because Sicilian food has also Spanish and Arab influences in it. Mm -hmm. And so this is a dish that has that kind of Mediterranean, right. Arab, Spanish influence that made Sicily so, so different. And mm -hmm. I think that as, as Italian Americans, we probably grew up with 
you know, Americanized versions yeah. of food. Right. Whereas I think, I think that this is something that I like to explore now when I go back mm -hmm. and forth. And I've been to Italy a few times, and I've been mm -hmm. to the north, and I've been to the south, and I've mm -hmm. just... I just love it. And the, it oh. makes me think of other dishes with eggplant, too. My wife makes a ratatouille. Oh, yeah. Which okay. Which is okay. similar, yeah. but I think maybe more, what, French? Yep. In its it heritage. Is. But, uh, again, that combination of eggplant with tomato product, mm -hmm. pepper, all the garden vegetables, fall seasoned vegetables is really wonderful. Well, you do. Well, I'm going to let you taste a little bit, continue, but... I did have some questions I wanted to ask you as my guest here today, and that is that you have brought some other, you know, fresh fruits. I see strawberries, grapes, uh, watermelon, and melon. And tell us a little bit about where these are grown mm -hmm. and how it relates to the research that you do at the experiment station, because I think that's pretty important for people to know that you're mm -hmm. kind of the bedrock of our agriculture out here. Right. in this uh, neck of the woods. So can you give right. us a little background on that? Well, let me start by talking a little about the research center for those that might not be familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, we are at North Willamette Research Extension Center. We're a 160-acre farm, mm -hmm. experimental farm, mm -hmm. and this is located right across the road from Charbonneau, so mm -hmm. just south of Wilsonville. And it's on county-owned property, so our right. county government <laughs> owns the land, and the university has responsible for the, doing the research mm -hmm. and the education for the farming community. Uh, and our focus is really um, probably summarized in three areas. Number one is we are focused on um, improving the productivity of the land, mm -hmm. uh, helping farmers grow more crop, and secondly, helping them be more um, um, financially um, viable, so profitability is a big mm -hmm. part, how to reduce costs and improve productivity. And then number three would be environmental protection. What can we do to better protect mm -hmm. the environment as we're doing our agricultural practices, have, have minimal mm -hmm. impact that way. Um, now, what I brought for you today are a couple of things that really relate to what we call new new crop development, okay. because uh, as far as kind of stimulating the agricultural economy, we're always looking for new crops. Farmers are always okay. looking for new crops to add to their portfolio, diversify their farming operation. That's what makes them more sustainable and hopefully more profitable. And so one of the things we have today, and oh, I'll just open perfect. that up, those are fresh Oregon strawberries. Oh my gosh. Here we are in the almost the first of October. And so uh, that's a new crop opportunity that we're working on with local farmers. Um, you know, I think most people know that our Oregon strawberries are some of the best, best tasting item. anywhere. Okay. Um, we used to be, up until the 1960s, 1970, we were the number one producing strawberry state in the entire country. And the strawberry production in this region of the country, the Pacific Northwest, really um, came over with the pioneers back in the 18, mid-1800s. And um, our climate is perfect, but our strawberries are a June-bearing crop. You get them for about four or five weeks out of the year. These are California varieties developed to be what we call um, day-neutral or ever-bearing. So they have a much longer period of flowering and fruit production. Um, but uh, anybody that knows strawberries that are available year-round from California, sometimes they the flavor is kind there. of That's crunch really like much. an yeah. apple, yeah. and they're white in the middle. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so what we've been experimenting with is how to grow those varieties under Oregon conditions, modify our cropping techniques so that we can produce a fresh strawberry much more than four weeks out of the year. These are being produced now between sometime in April till Thanksgiving. Oh, wow. April till Thanksgiving. So that's, that's you know, the eight months of the year, yeah. uh, seven anyway. Uh, and, and you should try one. Oh, I've got to try one. See what you think. Oh, what a um, feast today. And, and there's several varieties we're experimenting with. Uh, St. Uh, Anne's is one that you might see in the marketplace. Okay. Um, Albion is a, probably one? the more common one. 
um, um, there are varieties like that that are, like I what, say, dating What, what variety is this one like? This know? one is Albion. Albion. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, let me and, give and they've been really uh, fascinating to work with. Our people mm. are working with local farmers to kind of, we've got farmers oh, wow. that obviously are um, interested in trying to uh, fit a new crop into a farmer's market. We're never going to compete with California in production, but for a local fresh product at a farmer's market in a local grocery store uh, and having them up to Thanksgiving Giving. is pretty cool. I tell you, that's wonderful and it yeah. kind of warms my heart because I used to grow berries, but mm -hmm. back in the day it was Hoods and Rainiers yep. and oh gosh, there's another variety. Yeah. Don't remember, but I'm pleased yeah. to see. And isn't there a strawberry commission that you work with? And yes. you have, and you have plant uh, botanists who actually specifically work on these right. varieties. Then right. too. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, a, a lot of the work that we do at North Willamette, across all the crop systems mm. that we're working with, uh, which include all the berry crops, oh. um, vegetable crops, Christmas trees. A lot of the work we do is genetic improvement. Because the biggest gains you make in agriculture are really through genetics. Linux. And it doesn't matter whether it's plants or animals. I mean, that is historically <laughs> how we can improve the productivity and the gain as much as possible, financial gain. Um, so cultivar development or variety development is what we do a lot of at North Willamette is testing. So the breeding is done at the university in a laboratory in a greenhouse with for plants like these, and then they're trialed in the field oh, out right. at the research okay. center like a farmer would, what? where we could control all the activities in the field. And so varieties like the hood strawberry was developed by Oregon State University, University. And, okay. the un and the United States Department of Agriculture through our breeding cooperative breeding program. Um, if you've heard of Everybody has Marion Blackberry. That's another of ours. That Marian you Blackberry. developed. Those here. things just didn't occur in nature. Somebody crossed a male with a female, and boom, boom. No way you we got went. a different one. Well, yeah. tell me some. Of, so the strawberries are gorgeous. I just want them to, folks to get a look at this. Look at these. And this is September, end of September, beginning of October, and it's raining mm -hmm. out, and we are still producing these beautiful berries. Oh my stars! And I should say right. these are being produced under what we call low tunnels. So there is a season extension, keep the rain okay. off of them, keep a little more of the heat in. That's how we're able to do this. So you and use a little bit of the tech, just kind yep. of technology that will help yep. you, but not, not exactly. anything. Well, low tech, luck. low cost. Low cost. So okay. another, another yeah, example of new of crop stuff. development uh, would be this platter of grapes. Now these are all table grapes, and the season is getting a little long on those, especially with the rain we've been yeah. having. Um, but this is another opportunity for farmers. Uh, again, California is the largest producer of grapes by far. We'll never compete with them. But this mm -hmm. would be a specialty crop for, again, fresh market, whether it be farmers markets, local, mm -hmm. um, um, local, restaur or local restaurants, as well as grocery stores. So these are varieties. We have a, a good example of some of that variety development. Um, the University of Arkansas has the largest table grape breeding program in the United States. And so we're cooperating with them and have about 30 different varieties that we're, available, uh, that we're uh, mm -hmm. evaluating um, to see which ones grow best here in the Northwest and in the Willamette Valley. So for instance, on Yeah, on let's take a look at these. These, these are beautiful. Mm. Uh, this red one is a fairly common one that you will see uh, from time to time. It's called Einset. And mm -hmm. that's a red, um, a red seedless, and it has a bit of a strawberry flavor yeah, it does. to it. It's um, and then this this one over here, the purple one, that's what they that. call early Campbell, and it's got a seed, but uh, a van a wonderful, wonderful grape. So oh. you know, again, we have a. Mm. 30 different varieties and evaluating which ones this not only produce delicious. the best fruit, but have the best taste, um, or largest quantity, best taste, and then maybe keepability in the marketplace. Okay.
And so we so, do have folks that are actually growing these in the... Well, uh, yeah, there, there are, but I think there's room to develop a, a table grape industry here in the state, and that's what this is focused and, on. And that's, and that's not the first time that your, our experiment station up here has developed an industry. You mentioned that's Christmas right. trees, which yep. isn't a food product, but... Yeah, Christmas which, trees would be probably the best example of something that started from nothing. Um, it was in 1955 that Congress passed long-term capital gains for <coughs> trees, timber. And uh, up until then, you cut timber off the hill and went to the next yeah. hill. Nobody even planted trees. But it was as a result of that that people started planting trees in their forests. But those early forest owners said, well, shoot, why would I wait 70 years to have a yeah, crop? Yeah. I need something in between. And so somebody came up with the idea, the farmers did, that maybe we should grow an intermediate crop. What happens if we can culture Christmas trees and grow Christmas trees in a plantation instead of cutting them as wild trees out of the woods? That started in the 1950s, the very first planting from what we know in the entire region was right in Clackamas County. Hi, wow. <laughs> Clark's Four Corners right. area. Oh, okay, I know um, where that is, yeah, and, yeah. And from there, the early extension agents mm -hmm. in Clackamas County and in other counties in the valley um, started working with farmers. And here we now, in 1978, became the leading producer of Christmas trees in the entire United, United States. States, Oregon did. Yeah. And to this day, Clackamas County grows more Christmas trees than any other county wow. in the entire United States. One out of every 10 Christmas trees across America in every home comes, comes from, from Clackamas, Clackamas County. County. Wow. And so, so you think about the economic impact of that, creating a new industry, all the people that are employed, and the economic benefits in the community, not just to the farmers, mm. but to all of the other industries sure, that are yeah. touched, is pretty phenomenal. And so that's an example. And then the other really good one, that if you listen to OSU football games or basketball games, you'll, you'll hear people like uh, George Packing Company, who is the largest hazelnut packer <sighs> Hazelnuts processor. Hazelnuts are huge, yeah. And, and we export them. They will say, yeah, thanks yeah. to Oregon State University, you saved our industry right. when Eastern filbert blight became a problem in the early 1990s. And through genetic improvement and finding blight-resistant varieties of hazelnuts today, that industry is not just thriving, but growing it's very really, rapidly. It's really, really growing rapidly. So that's, wow. that's what we do. And see, that's the connection I want to make here, is that um, our, our ag economy is critical to our county, mm -hmm. it's critical to our area, and Clackamas County hosts this hub of agriculture through Oregon State University right here in our own area. And you not only do foods like eggplants and tomatoes and the berries, but you have more here. You also have a watermelon and yeah. another and a cantaloupe. So tell me about those two food crops. I well, mean, are those just... Is, is that just something, what's, what's going on with that's, that testing? That's part of like... produce. That's part of produce. Okay. And uh, one of the foundational kind of crop systems we deal with at North Willamette is, is vegetable production. Okay. So our vegetable growers grow things like cantaloupe and watermelon <laughs> as well. Now, watermelon's a little tricky because you need a really warm dry oh, summer, yeah. and boy, it, we got it this year. We got year. it this year. And We're so we have watermelon. lots of watermelon and cantaloupe. <laughs> a little hard some years. Um, but yeah, it's, it's part of uh, all the, those crop. We, we deal with 10 different crop systems at North Willamette. Wow. So we cover the waterfront from nursery, greenhouse production, vegetable production, hazelnut production, Christmas trees, field crops. Um, we have a small farms extension program. Um, we you go do, down just do it all. You do, do it all. all. And I get to be, one of the things is I get to be on your board, which is mm -hmm. one of the most fun things I get to do in my job because um, I love what you do. I'm a real supporter of OSU. I love what you guys do there. I visited you uh, multiple times through the years to tour your fields. I want to thank you so much for your friendship through the years um, and working with you and being willing to come in to share the caponata with mm -hmm. me um, and then uh, actually and then I'll be sharing a meal with you again uh, Friday night. Well this has been a lot of fun harvest. Martha thank yeah. you for having me and I always love talking about 
food and agriculture. And so this is about a perfect <laughs> blend right here. Me too. And I'm going to bring, uh, I'll, bring I'll send some home with you too. That's what we perfect. do as Italians, yeah. right? That's we right. Send, we send That's food right. home with people. And I will bring a little bit of mine for a taste. Okay. We'll see. Okay. Right. That'd be kind of That'd fun. That'd be a lot of fun. We'll do that. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Mike. And thank, thank you for you. all your hard work in the county through these years. It's just been delightful. And thank you for coming to Cooking with the Commissioner.